Tonight, police swoop on looters accused of robbing flood victims at Maribyrnong. Hackers hold a major health fund to ransom, threatening to release private information. A Green senator facing a scandal over her secret relationship with Dustin Martin's uncle. The top doctor warning the Alfred Hospital is in dire need of an upgrade. Achuka and Kerrang become sandbag towns. The latest on Victoria's floods. And why Alistair Clarkson could be coaching the kangaroos within days. Live from Melbourne, 7 News with Peter Mitchell starts now. Good evening. Police have made a major breakthrough in the hunt for looters accused of preying on Maribyrnong flood victims. Sarah Jones has the details and Sarah, two men have been arrested in Melbourne's west. Midge, police say the two men broke into an empty home on Monday morning just as the owner was coming to terms with everything they'd already lost in the devastating floods. Two men aged 26 and 33 from Sunshine West were arrested this morning and spent the day being questioned at Footscray Police Station. Police allege they stole $15,000 worth of personal items like iPads and laptops from a home that was unoccupied because it had been damaged in Friday's floods. One man is facing 12 charges, including burglary. He's been granted bail. The other is facing deception offences and will be charged on summons. And Mitch, police are still looking for a third person. Sarah Jones at Maribyrnong. Thank you. The nation's largest health insurance provider is officially being held to ransom. Hackers are threatening to release sensitive medical records unless Medibank Private pays up. The latest mass cyber theft, breathtaking. Home Affairs Minister Claire O'Neill angry, exasperated. The hackers demanding an undisclosed ransom threatening to release the medical histories of 4.6 million Medibank and AHM customers. The threat that is being made here to make the private personal health information of Australians made available to the public is a dog act. Clearly unhappy with Medibank too, it assured customers last week no data had been stolen. That has changed. Today, Medibank revealing the hackers claim to have 200 gigabytes of customer data and have sent samples of 100 AHM and international student accounts as proof, including names, addresses, Medicare numbers, phone numbers and medical claims histories. Which is a real reminder uh, that we live in a world in which uh, cybercrime and cybersecurity issues are front and centre. The hackers also claim to have customers' credit card details, although provided no proof of that. Trading in Medibank shares has been suspended. Government sources tell Seven News, unlike the Optus hack, this one's sophisticated, apparently the work of organised cyber criminals. The Federal Police are investigating with the help of the Australian Signals Directorate, our nation's cyber spies. Medibank CEO David Koskar said the insurer would remain open and transparent, but declined interview requests. In a statement saying, I unreservedly apologise for this crime against our customers. I know that many will be disappointed with Medibank, and they are. You just wonder, it's like they're paying lip service to data security. I want to know what's happening with my information. It's just scaring a lot of Australians. Medibank says it's contacting all those whose details were revealed by the hackers. If you see text messages, if you get emails, um, dodgy things about clicking on links, don't do it. Don't click. Report. Mark Riley, 7 News. Green Senator Lydia Thorpe is facing a scandal over a secret relationship with a former bikey boss. She's been dumped from the party's leadership team after admitting she briefly dated the uncle of AFL star Dustin Martin. She's the controversial senator now in the centre of her own political storm. To the colonising Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Lydia Thorpe today ordered to resign from her position as Deputy Senate Leader following revelations she was in an undisclosed relationship with former Rebels bikey boss Dean Martin. The pair dating while she was sitting on the Joint Law Enforcement Committee. It was clear, it was clear that this could be perceived as affecting her work. Senator Thorpe has said uh, that this is a, an error of judgment. 
Uh, that's the least description that I would put to it. Greens leader Adam Band kept in the dark about the secret relationship. And it's disappointing because it's uh, an error, a significant error of judgment. Even by his own chief of staff. I have a very good and competent chief of staff who makes uh, many good decisions. This was not one of them. In a statement, the Senator for Victoria said, I accept that I have made mistakes and have not exercised good judgment, adding that she and Mr Martin remain friends. Lydia Thorpe insists that any confidential documents she received during her time on the Law Enforcement Committee were treated in confidence, including information on how the Federal Police monitor outlaw motorcycle gangs. Taylor Aiken, 7 News. A senior trauma doctor has taken aim at the Andrews government saying it's ignoring his pleas about the dire state of the Alfred Hospital. Professor Mark Fitzgerald fears there are plans to sell the site. Professor Mark Fitzgerald treats the state's most critically ill patients, including the Premier, after his back injury last year. But the trauma specialist says the hospital where he treats them is crumbling around him. Now, the stuff was designed 50 or 60 years ago. It's just not fit for purpose. Professor Fitzgerald says the Premier's office has ignored his questions about the upgrade of operating theatres. Is the Alfred going to continue on site? Are you actually going to fund the application that you've been considering and giving us um, lots of positive feedback for 12 years, 12 years. Even wondering, will it be sold? Well, there's a nice prime piece of real estate. The, the only people who close hospitals are the Liberals. Let's be very clear about that. Daniel Andrews rejecting suggestions his government has shunned the top doctor. We've had a bit on these last few days um, and it was like two weeks ago. So, as I said, I've, I've known Mark for a very long time. Professor Fitzgerald says he sent an email and made phone calls. It wasn't during the floods or anything like that. And, and so here we are. The AMA is backing demands for an Alfred overhaul. Before the pandemic, it lobbied for $2 billion to fix ageing infrastructure. Because I've specifically called in this round and in this election submission for support for the maintenance and improvement of the circumstances at Alfred Hospital. And I do note the radio silence. In May, senior Alfred doctor Professor John Wilson resigned because of the poor state of the healthcare system. Doctors say there have been maintenance issues for years. In 2019, doctors at the Alfred were forced to relocate operations because of the dilapidated state of the buildings. While repairs were done, a portable classroom was erected nearby for major heart surgery. We have provided the Alfred with very, very substantial funding over our time in office. Uh, and. Uh, I've made a lot of health commitments. Um, have I finished yet? No. Emma O'Sullivan, 7 News. Echuca is tonight a walled community as locals use a brief reprieve from flooding rains to reinforce their levy. Paul Dowsley is there this evening and Paul, they've also got a blunt message for would-be looters. Mitch, Echuca, Echuca Village and Moama are all prepared for floodwaters and lawbreakers with so many houses evacuated and abandoned in this area. This is the warning that's sprayed outside one house here in Echuca Village. It says loot in this area, die in this area. A couple of kisses after that as the locals here prepare for what could be their worst flood since 1993 and it's coming this weekend. In the sandbag city of Echuca, they're one day closer to inundation. Right, the main street is closed and bracing for the worst. Thousands of residents back at it to protect their town from what's coming from the Murray River, now expected to peak Sunday. Every bit of her body's aching, but keep going, everyone. keep going. I'm eight and a half months pregnant. And it won't stop you? No. I, well, I've got made myself a chair, so I'm all right now. Restaurateur Brett Thomas brought in an expert for advice on his sandbag wall to keep the water out. One of the builders here went and made some phone calls and got some surveyors, and we got some height, so we actually know what height we need to build this. Fire crews pumping water out of stormwater drains, emptying 1.8 megalitres elsewhere to reduce the impact of the coming rain. And on the river, patrols with hard-working crews. 14 days straight. We're really worried about the water that's coming in from the Goulburn. 
These patrols are not just to keep an eye on properties and look out for residents that might need to be rescued, but also to help wildlife that have become stranded. Like this wallaby, too scared to move. Makes me pretty upset. It was taken to safety. Heartwarming stories too from generous locals at cafes to help sandbagging volunteers. They're not dropping off cash, they're saying, can we buy 10 coffees, can we buy 100 sandwiches? Other businesses ready for hard months ahead to rebuild when they should be filled with tourists. I can't see how we would have anyone here before early next year. In Shepparton, help from Queensland, SES arrived this morning. 18 personnel that are providing um, flood boat crews as well as um, in water, swift water rescue teams. Paul Dowsley, 7 News. Not far away at Kerrang, levees have now been built across the main highway north and south of the town and residents have been told it's too late to leave. Rochelle Brown is there this evening. Rochelle, it's now a waiting game. Mitch, a new flood warning has now been issued for tomorrow afternoon, potentially impacting 40 to 50 properties outside the town's levee. Now, the Bureau of Meteorology predicts the Loddon River will peak below the height of the levee here at a very similar height to the 2011 flood. Now, if it holds, the power station and majority of the homes here will be safe. The town is still making preparations to be cut off for seven days with several rural properties along the river on the outskirts of Kerrang and up and south, already surrounded by water. Right now, the river is holding steady. Mitch? Rochelle Brown at Kerrang. Thank you. A vehicle belonging to Darren Hinch's Justice Party has been targeted by a vandal in Melbourne's southeast. A street sign was smashed through the front windscreen and the side of the van was defaced. Police arrested a St Kilda man on Hampton Street a short time later. He's facing a string of charges including criminal damage. The wait for a verdict continues in the Parliament House rape trial. Jurors retired without a decision this afternoon on the second day of deliberations. They're deciding whether Bruce Lerriman is guilty or not guilty of raping political staffer Brittany Higgins in 2019. Deliberations will resume in the morning. The Andrews government is promising some of the most ambitious renewable energy targets in the world as it makes climate change a top election priority. It wants to bring back the old SEC to ensure Victorians have access to cheaper and cleaner power. Sold off in the mid-1990s. 10, maybe $15 billion the state government hopes to get for the SEC. In 2022, it's an election sell with a promise of cheaper power. A re-elected Labor government has a plan to bring back the SEC. A revived state electricity commission would be responsible for building new renewable energy projects. The initial $1 billion plan would deliver 4.5 gigawatts of power. It comes with a new renewable energy target of 95% by 2035 and new emissions reduction target of up to 80%. 51% ownership by the Victorian taxpayer and we will look to super funds as our preferred investment partner for the other 49%. The Grattan Institute is on board. The market structures that we set up in the 90s and the 2000s have not been coping with a rapid transition in the energy market. But it's also applying caution around how the SEC is structured, saying if it's not done correctly, it could drive up prices. Private investors will probably be very spooked if you have an organisation where the minister can direct it to do things you know, at, at will. Labor would also bring forward the net zero emissions target by five years to 2045. Really, we're up there with the global leaders when it comes to climate action. The state opposition didn't have any immediate reaction to the announcement, instead saying they'll make their own energy announcements in the lead up to the election. You know, it's their plan. Uh, let, let the government sell that. I'm sure um, our shadow minister will have more to say on that. And, and our plans in the uh, in the days to come. Chanel Bella, 7 News. A former police officer has been jailed for three years for using hidden cameras to secretly record a teenage girl and a woman. He committed his crimes while working with victims of sex offences. 
Attempting to slip past the cameras, Simon Lubers sent in a decoy, a relative disguised in a mask, hat and glasses, while he was in a car pulling up at the front entrance of the Moorabbin Magistrates Court. The former sergeant made the mad dash inside. They were his last seconds of freedom before the perverted police officer was jailed for three years. The 44-year-old admits he produced child abuse material after installing a spy camera in a 13-year-old girl's bedroom. He'd also stalked another woman over five years, placing surveillance cameras in her bathroom. He sent the images to other men. Luba's family is standing by him. Are you proud of your wife? Are you proud of your son? Yes, yes. yes. The magistrate said Simon Luber's actions had devastated these women's lives. Your offending against this child was willful, selfish and heinous for your own greedy desire for sexual gratification. The irony is Luber's was a police prosecutor working to keep sex offenders off our streets while he was committing these vile crimes. His convictions have landed him on the sex offenders register for the next 15 years. He will be eligible for parole after serving two years in prison, most likely held in protective custody. Jade Vincent, 7 News. Drivers are being told to fill up now as petrol prices surge by up to 40 cents a litre. Service stations in Melbourne's north and south east are charging over $2 a litre. There's at least a few days for people to get some of that cheapish petrol at around $1.75. Uh, before all those stations go up to around $2.15. The jump in prices comes three weeks after the fuel excise tax break ended. In AFL news, Alistair Clarkson and Chris Fagan could be back at the helm of North Melbourne and Brisbane within days. Chief football reporter Tom Brown has the latest. Tom, the AFL still facing hurdles with its inquiry. Mitch they are, but crucially today the league acknowledged both coaches' right to the presumption of innocence until proven guilty. Crucially, that's basically a green light for both coaches, in particular Clarks, in a couple of weeks to return to coaching in advance of the conclusion of this investigation. Now, a significant barrier remains contact with the alleged victims. The AFL still doesn't know their actual identities, can only work through the lawyers, and there's no guarantee, which this is important, that the alleged victims will even take part in this process. I think in our community, in our country, certainly in our game, there's a presumption of innocence. And so they're employed by those clubs. We've been part of the conversations. I think at some point they will return to work, but if they've been growing up discussions and the, the right communication process will be in play for that. Mitch, the AFL, not Hawthorne, will pay the parties reasonable legal costs including Clarkson and Fagans. That'll all be worked out. The investigation, interestingly, will also include whether the management or the board knew of these potential issues. The AFL hoping to have this all wrapped up by the end of December. Gil McLaughlin will stay in his job until it's all concluded to the satisfaction of the parties, Mitch. Tom Brown at Docklands, thank you. And AFL clubs and players could be in for extra cash and Tim Watson, it's set to be a win for fans as well. Mitch, a big win. Every team looks set to play an extra game for Premiership points in 2023. We'll explain why shortly. Also, drama ahead of Saturday's Cox Plate for leading trainer Gay Waterhouse. A dilemma for the Aussies after a World Cup injury blow. And, Mitch, it was a dirty day for Ben Simmons in his Brooklyn Nets taboo. I'll see you again soon. OK, thanks very much indeed. Tim. The search for a missing Australian sportsman in Spain has ended in tragedy. He was found dead inside a nightclub. And the police investigation is next on 7 News. Also, a shocking northern suburbs road rage attack. Powerball's $100 million jackpot, the southeast suburb considered Melbourne's luckiest. After sport, the rise in midlife dementia and what you can do. And it's a warm and humid Friday, but there is the risk of late thunderstorms. I'll have the full details later in seven years. Fraudsters have scammed Victorians out of more than $4 million using remote access software. It normally begins with an unsolicited call from a scammer claiming to work for a reputable company. And they'll often talk through the victim uh, in installing that software and then giving access to the scammer so they can control the computer remotely. There have been 153 victims in just the past five months. 
An ICE user has pleaded guilty to setting a man on fire during a road rage attack in Melbourne's northern suburbs. Hussain Kesey says he was paranoid someone was following him when he ambushed the innocent driver. When arrested by police over a terrifying road rage attack, Hussein Kissy initially played dumb. But the 36-year-old plasterer now owns up to his horrific crime, today pleading guilty to setting an innocent driver on fire in Epping last year. Kissy had been using ice and was suffering from paranoia when he pulled up next to the 19-year-old victim and doused him and his car with fuel. When Kissy threw a burning rag at the car, the victim caught a light, the teen fearing he was about to burn to death. The young man suffered severe burns to much of his body and spent nine days in hospital. To this day, he still feels uncomfortable and anxious when driving alone. Kissy says his drug use contributed to his erratic behaviour, telling police he'd felt possessed at the time. I could have handled myself better if I wasn't on the <laughs> The Epping man will be sentenced next month. Estelle Graping, Seven News. A promising rugby league player from Queensland has been found dead in a Spanish nightclub. He was reported missing earlier in the week, leaving his family and friends to question why it took so long to find him. Liam loved his mullet and his mates Whoa! on a Europe adventure. He wrote, my life is fantastic, but partying in Spain, panic set in. Here's Liam smiling with friends in a club. He vanished soon after. Gold Coast Titans player AJ Brimson set out a desperate appeal with Liam missing for 30 hours in Barcelona. A lot of us were worried about him and to, to hear that news this morning, um, it, was, it was very hard to take. The news, nightclub staff had discovered a body. It's believed he had fallen 10 metres. Liam's father says, words cannot express our grief. We cannot thank his mates enough for being there with Liam, having the time of his life and assisting in the search for our boy. Hard felt feelings out to his parents and yeah. He had an impact on the field, but he had such a massive impact off the field too. From his sister, Liam was the best brother I could have asked for and made me a better person. Now grappling with losing him on an end of season trip. Police here in Barcelona have now ruled the death an accident. They say their investigation here is complete. The questions still remain as to why it took so long to find Liam. He had a, a bright future ahead of him, not just in rugby league, but, but in life in general. Remembered as someone who could bring a smile to any room. Cheers, guys. Just not today. In Barcelona, Katie Brown, 7 News. Back home now, Australia's second biggest lottery winner could be crowned in coming hours with $100 million on offer in tonight's Powerball draw. It's the first time in three years the jackpot has reached that high. Up to half of all Australian adults are expected to buy a ticket. For the record, Frankston is considered Melbourne's luckiest postcode. Students in Melbourne's north are being forced to dodge trucks to get in and out of school. Parents are calling for urgent action. That's next on 7 News. Also the verdict on lockdowns and their long-term impact according to an independent review. New details on the bay and river water quality after the floods. And Britain's Prime Minister in a world of woe just 44 days into the job. The EPA is urging people not to swim at beaches with toxic flood water still seeping into the bay. EPA scientists are testing the river for contamination issues. They're also collecting samples from flood ravaged homes. Stay away from it, stay away from the mud, take a precautionary approach. If you're cleaning the mud yourself, use boots, wear a pair of gloves, wear a mask. More than 250 tonnes of hard waste has also been collected in Maribyrnong as the flood cleanup continues. A damning report into Australia's handling of the pandemic has found the lockdowns were excessive. The Independent Review also declared it was wrong to close entire school systems and women and children suffered the most. Haunting scenes of empty streets, still fresh in the minds of Victorians, and now an acknowledgement. We can see things that we 
did get wrong. An independent report led by Professor Peter Shergold has found while lockdowns were important in the short term, they should have only ever been used briefly to buy time. The mistake we think we made is that we didn't use those lockdowns sufficiently to set up contact tracing, to make sure we had quarantine arrangements in place. It found that closing schools was also a mistake, which has caused long-term learning and mental health challenges. I think it was always wrong to shut down whole school systems. It was much better to shut down schools when incidents occurred. It was cruel. They played politics and parents have every right today to be angry. One of the report's 300 contributors, the former Deputy Chief Medical Officer. It's absolutely correct. School closures were never necessary and the virus was never going to affect uh, kids. We knew that in a, in a significant way, so we could have kept the schools open. Other key findings, financial support wasn't fairly distributed and vulnerable groups like the elderly weren't well protected. The purpose of the report wasn't to point fingers but to learn from the pandemic so we're better prepared for the next one. But the Premier says he hasn't read it and doesn't know if he ever will. Well, this is a national report that I've not read and I think it's written by a bunch of uh, academics and that's fine, that's, that's their job. There was nothing academic about COVID-19. The one thing we can be sure is that there will be another one. Christy Cooper, 7 News. British Prime Minister Liz Truss is under more pressure tonight. Home Secretary Suella Braverman is the latest minister to go, forced to resign after admitting breaching email security protocols. More and more Conservative Party figures are calling on Liz Truss to resign. Mr Speaker, I am a fighter and not a quitter. A poll has found a third of Conservative Party members want Boris Johnson to replace Liz Truss. There are rolling blackouts across Ukraine tonight after drones destroyed key energy infrastructure. But there are claims Russia is suffering even more and may withdraw troops as its army struggles to hold its ground. A meeting of Russia's Security Council, a president clinging onto control. Vladimir Putin tightening security across his country and declaring martial law in the four Ukrainian regions he illegally annexed. I think that Vladimir Putin finds himself in an incredibly difficult position. The four regions are under partial Russian control, Moscow losing territory daily as Ukraine wins it back. That's what happened in Kupiansk, Russian occupation ending after a fierce battle here last month. This town was a big strategic loss for the Russians, crucial to their supply lines. It's a railway hub with tracks connecting their military base across the border to the front lines of eastern Ukraine's Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Which is why fighting continues. In the southern city of Kherson, tens of thousands of civilians evacuated by Russian-installed authorities ahead of a Ukrainian offensive. Kyiv called it a propaganda show as more missiles and drones were shot down over the capital. It seems his only tool available to him is to brutalise individual citizens, to try to intimidate them into capitulating. They're not going to do that. In Ukraine, Sarah Greenolch. 7 News. Back home now and residents are demanding an overhaul of a dangerous northern suburbs intersection claiming it's putting their children at risk. Students are forced to dodge trucks while walking to school prompting fears someone will get hit. The intersection of Boulderwood Parade and Broadway is reservoir's most dangerous, yet hundreds of children are forced to navigate it daily. Uh, it's not very easy, but there's always people like coming around quite fast. Teachers and parents won't let them walk it alone. We really fear for, our, for the safety of ourselves, our children, and it's just frightening. Literally putting our bodies in front of the traffic to get the kids across the road. The intersection sits between two schools and a swimming pool. There are five entry points and trucks use it to travel between Plenty Road and the M80. Sometimes people will stop, sometimes people will rush through and the kids can't be expected to actually navigate that on their own. Parents are seeking an election promise to rip up the roundabout and replace it with a designated pedestrian crossing and traffic lights. I have had maybe one close call where 
a car sped up and stopped like a fi a five meters before reaching me. It was quite scary. This intersection on Sussex and Gaffney streets in Pascoe Vale was changed earlier this year due to community outcry. Reservoir parents are just asking for something similar to make sure their children get to school safely. This needs to be under independent review. We'll be putting pressure on Vic Roads. Kathleen O'Connor, Seven News. Cost of living pressure is propelling Australians to fix their cars themselves, but it could have dangerous consequences. That's next on 7 News. Also an alarming increase in the number of teenagers vaping. Back to life, how one of our most endangered marsupials is thriving on Phillip Island. And after sport, a rise in midlife dementia, but there are steps to reduce your risk. The number of Victorians who vape has almost doubled in the past four years. Young women are leading the trend with one in six picking up the habit. Colours, branding, flavours like Fruit Loops and milk, all designed to hook young people and keep them hooked and addicted. Vic Health says there is a misunderstanding about the health risks which include cancer and heart disease. Pharmacy giant Chemist Warehouse has recorded an annual net profit of almost $400 million. The surge in sales during the pandemic and a rush on rapid COVID tests helped boost the bottom line. It's $153 million more than the previous year and one of the biggest profits for an Australian private company. The cost of living crunch is forcing Australians to buy cheap car parts online, but motoring groups warn there are hidden dangers in DIY repairs. With the cost of staying on the road getting out of control, Kelvin's been saving on parts online. Usually the cost is uh, much cheaper than uh, you know where you'd go into retail markup. With the range for his home repairs. From air fresheners to uh, wind windshield wipers, uh, and as well as uh, headlights, air intake upgrades, um, and then all the way from brakes and things like that. We have over 4 million products uh, for sale. Uh, from Australian sellers and we sell a car part every four seconds as Aussies look to save a trip to the mechanic. With sales of dent repair kits up 43% on last year, scratch repair kits by more than a third, windscreen wiper sales up 23%. But the Motor Traders Association warns home mechanics know your limitations. If people are wishing to fix parts, whether it be brake pads or other major safety items on the vehicle, then yes, it could be very dangerous. You're far better to be going to a qualified and licensed mechanic. Each year, on average, five people are killed, 160 injured, doing their own vehicle repair. The experts say if you are doing it yourself, do it safely. Like using the right tools the right way, that jack that came with the car. It's only designed for changing tyres and must never be used to get under your car. Paul Caddack, Seven News. A near extinct species has been brought back from the brink at Phillip Island. Five years after the eastern barred bandicoot was reintroduced, the marsupials have flourished, spreading out 10 kilometres from the original colony. It's the only species in the world that has gone from extinct in the wild to endangered and no longer requiring a captive breeding program. Locals have even spotted bandicoots in their backyards. Sport is next with Tim Watson and Tim. There's said to be more AFL games played for premiership points. Mitch, an extra round is in the works with the lure of cash for players and clubs will have the details next. Also, the coaching bureau hitting out at the Saints over Brett Ratton's treatment. Why Gay Waterhouse's top runner might be a late scratching for the Cox Plate. The Aussies make a last minute inclusion for their World Cup campaign. A big Ben falls flat in his Brooklyn Nets debut. Welcome back, AFL clubs and players are preparing for an extra round of footy next year, returning to Chief Football Reporter Tom Brown. And Tom, they're set to receive a cash splurge too. Tim, this is a hugely exciting concept. The AFL now 50-50 on a magic round next season, an extra dedicated round replacing one of the pre-season games. The idea, you go to a dedicated state, have all 18 teams there, all nine games there, across an actual round, a proper home and away round that weekend. Now, the players, generally speaking, are supportive. They'd get a fair chunk of money. The club's also supportive. They'd get a smaller amount of money, but albeit significant, 
For the AFL, Tim, it's really a marketing exercise, but it would have a huge wow factor, particularly in the front half of the year. Now, states are lobbying hard, in particular South Australia, also WA and New South Wales. This was Gil McLaughlin on the concept. It's something we've been looking at. It went to the Commission on, on Tuesday. Um, I think that it's, there is good momentum, but we've got a few issues to solve for the Commission. South Australia's put their hands as being keen. We've got a couple of other states keen to do it. And we're going to finalise the logistics, and I reckon we need to make a call in the next week or so. Timmy, in the background, the board broadcasters are doing the numbers, the AFL are doing the numbers. The AFL has also got to look at the fixture. For example, if it was in East, on Easter, it would affect Easter, Monday, Hawthorne, Geelong. There's all those types of permutations. The AFL's only got five days to decide. You can't have two fixtures. They've got to go with a fixture, a dedicated one, in coming weeks, Tim. Thanks, Tom. Still on AFL, and Brett Ratton's received the backing of a cross-code ally over his treatment at the hands of St Kilda. Championship-winning Melbourne Victory coach Ernie Merrick worked as a consultant at the Saints this year. It's one of the worst I've seen, and um, it's quite disgraceful, really. It's demeaning. It's, it's not called for. Ross Lyon's appointment is expected to be announced in the coming days. Cameron Green has just been given a late call-up to Australia's T20 World Cup. The big-hitting all-rounder has replaced injured backup keeper Josh Inglis in the squad after a freak accident. While Australia trained behind closed doors, it wasn't who's in, but who's out. The tournament already over for Josh Inglis due to a freak golfing injury, which damaged the wicketkeeper's hand. Dug in sharply and, yeah, the shaft snapped, so he's obviously gutted. It's a tight-knit group and I think any time that, that type of thing happens, um, you feel for that person. Gambling on Matthew Wade staying fit, informal rounder Cameron Green has been called in to replace Inglis. Um, there's, there's no way... Um, unless there's another injury, that, that he would come into the starting line. We're pretty settled with what that looks like. Having made last year's final against Australia, New Zealand will be no easy beats. They're a tough opponent. Um, you know, our, our record against them in, in recent times has been good. Rain is forecast for Saturday night's sellout at the SCG. The weather, the crowd and history could be against the Kiwis, who haven't won in any form of cricket on Australian soil since 2011. That stat doesn't fly with the Black Caps. We've played enough cricket here as well to understand, uh, I suppose, how World Cup play works and, and what we need to bring to the table. We're definitely excited about the talent we have in our group. Andrew McKinlay, 7 News. There's drama for Gay Waterhouse ahead of the Cox Plate. Mitch Cleary is at Mooney Valley and Mitch, her star runner, may not get a start. Well, Tim, Gay Waterhouse has achieved everything there is to achieve in Australian racing, except win the Cox Plate. And this year's runner, Alligator Blood, faces a last-minute fitness call tomorrow. Just this morning, Alligator Blood waded through the water at Altona Beach before confirmation from vets the horse had shown lameness in the front left leg. It faces a further inspection tomorrow afternoon. One man who knows how to win the Cox Plate is Peter Ty, a co-owner in four-time winner Winx. This this year, he saddles up Al Bodegon for the, the major race. He's got good form. He's a, he's a good European horse. He's, he's come over here with good credentials, and uh, that's what you need to win a Cox Plate because it's uh, the best of the best, Australia's greatest way for age race. So he'll need to be on top of his game. But, you know, we've got our fingers crossed, and we hope he gets a good run and comes out on top. Tonight, the who's who of racing has assembled here at Mooney Valley for the Cox Plate centenary dinner. Gay Waterhouse herself expected to arrive shortly before that fitness test tomorrow for Alligator Blood. And just confirmation today, Tim, that very elegant last year's Melbourne Cup winner had been retired after 11 Group 1 wins. Tim? Ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Mitch. Ben Simmons is off to a rocky start with the Brooklyn Nets after sitting out all of last season. The Aussie had just four points, five rebounds and five assists before getting fouled out against New Orleans. Finishes on the... Bulls. And a foul is called. Ben Simmons upset. The Nets going down by 22 points. In the Premier League, Manchester United defeated Tottenham 2-0 at Old Trafford. Not quite, but it is Fred. And now Fernandes! Bruno Fernandes gloriously doubles Manchester United's lead. Cristiano Ronaldo is being slammed, though, for yet another display of petulance after being left on the bench. The 37-year-old stormed up the tunnel 
with five minutes still to go in the game. No I in team, Mitch. It's a team that sport. That is bad behaviour. It is indeed. Thank you, Tim. Increasing numbers of middle-aged Australians are being struck down with dementia. Researchers believe lifestyle choices are contributing to the problem, but there are ways to reduce your risk. Joyce Coppy was only 59 when she started forgetting where the plates belonged. Her husband Joe increasingly noticing odd behaviour. Like the pantry, right, to go and get, say, the cereal. She sometimes would go to the fridge. Joyce was diagnosed with early onset dementia and nine years later her condition has worsened. She knows who I am but sometimes doesn't know my name. So these are changes that might reflect the uh, early onset of Alzheimer's disease. Young onset dementia is striking increasing numbers of people in their 40s, 50s and 60s. We're getting more young onset dementia. That might be because of our lifestyle. Here in Australia we expect the number to almost double by the year 2058. Warning signs include memory loss, changes in judgment, mood and personality. We can slow down dementia if it's uh, coming upon us and we can also reduce our risk of developing dementia. Seven hours sleep, a Mediterranean diet, power walking and staying socially engaged could all help stave off the condition. The free Dementia Australia Brain Health app monitors cognitive changes. If you notice it early, really get on top of it. Joe Coppy makes sure Joyce still leads a happy, fulfilling life. At my age, I get forgetful too. So what? Just go for it. Don't let it stop you. Jackie Quist, 7 News. Jane Bunn is next with the forecast. And Jane, it could be a stormy end to the week. Absolutely, Mitch. A Friday looks at warm and humid and unsettled. We have the risk of late thunderstorms. I'll have the full details on that next. Tonight on the latest from 7 News, not bluffing, hackers prove they have your Medibank data every development. Dame Judy Dench, no fan of the Crown, her stinging criticism and luxury coaches with fold-out beds, are they enough for you to avoid the airport? When it breaks, we'll have it live at 10.55. Hello again. As expected, there's not much rain in far northern Victoria today. A local storm's there tonight, then the action increases tomorrow afternoon. The city is having another cracking day. Bright sunshine and a light to moderate southerly. That let the city reach 21. It's now 18. It was warmer in eastern suburbs, 23 in Moorabbin, 25 in Scoresby, Watsonia and Yarra Glen. The southwest had foggy, humid cloud at first, so it did only reach 18 in Geelong. Skies were generally clear in southern Victoria, but the north has large areas of cloud building. So far, only a bit of activity in the northwest corner. The cloud meant that it was actually warmer in Bendigo than it was in Mildura. The main activity remains to our north, where there are lines of thunderstorms. More than 60 millimetres in Ivanhoe, only one millimetre in Ogan and Mildura, as the low that's bringing the storms is over western New South Wales. It is about to be on the move, making a beeline for Victoria tomorrow. Here is our slight risk of storms in the far north this evening. Tomorrow morning does look generally dry. Then with that low coming in, the activity explodes in the afternoon and evening. Hit and miss thunderstorms means not everyone here will see one, but the whole area is at risk. For the next few days, these thunderstorms can bring heavy rain, but it's localised. It only falls directly underneath the storm. There's actually warmth and sunshine either side. But from Sunday or Monday, we could return to widespread soaking rain. That's when river flooding can be renewed as widespread means there's a lot more water. So all these rivers are back on flood watch. Now, if you don't live near a river, there's no issue. But if you do live near one of these, be aware of the warnings in coming days. Around the nation tomorrow, there is a risk of showers and thunderstorms through much of the east. Showers arrive late in Hobart. Adelaide, mostly dry. Perth, showers developing. To Victoria, all parts of the state are at risk of showers and thunderstorms, less so in Gippsland. Now, not everyone will see one, but the risk is there. And if the rain's heavy, the rain is heavy if it is directly overhead. Closer in on a warm and humid Friday, it is generally dry for much of the day. There's the slight chance of showers. But in the late afternoon and evening, 
We all have the risk of thunderstorms. Not everyone will see one, but the risk is there. And that's why the rainfall range is 0 to 20 millimetres. The city are humid 24, the chance of storms from about 4pm onwards. To the eight-day outlook, the storm risk continues overnight into early Saturday, gradually clears during the morning, then quite dry for Saturday afternoon and evening. Sunday, quite dry in the morning, then rain slowly develops ahead of what we have on Monday. Rain coming through, that's our next big weather day. So we are warm and humid 24 tomorrow, generally dry, then the risk of late storms, Mitch. OK, thank you very much indeed, Jane. And that's the way it is this Thursday, the 20th of October. Thanks for your company. For now, from the 7 News team, good night.